Whether ancient unsolved mysteries or more recent crimes that remain unanswered, these creepy mysteries all puzzle experts and desperately need to be solved. Number 5. One of the most famous legends about King Arthur is of the sword pulled from the stone. But that legend may have been based on a real-life story that has left scientists scratching their heads at the mystery more than 800 years later. The strange story starts with an Italian knight named Galgano Guidati, the son of a minor noble in the Tuscany area. He spent most of his life as a sort of mercenary and had little value for the lives of others. But according to legend, he had a vision at the age of 32. The archangel Michael appeared to Galgano and showed him the way to salvation. The knight was so moved by the vision that he decided to become a hermit and live in one of the caves near his hometown of Chiusdino. This decision upset his family, in particular his mother, Dionysia. They believed he was insane and tried to convince him to return to his previous life. When Galgano refused, his mother told him to at least visit his fiancée one last time and tell her what was happening. This was a reasonable request and Galgano got on a horse and began to travel to his fiancée. As they passed Monte Siepi, something seemed to spook the horse and it reared up, throwing Galgano to the ground. The knight was helped by invisible hands and urged to travel to the top of Monte Siepi. Then came another vision at the top of the mountain. On top of a nearby hill, he saw a temple that was not really there. Outside stood Jesus and Mary surrounded by apostles. Galgano was urged to climb that hill, which he did. There, the archangel Michael came to him again and told him to give up his worldly possessions. According to one version of the story, Galgano claimed that this would be as difficult as splitting a stone with a sword. He hit a stone with his weapon to emphasize his point, only for the blade to plunge into the stone almost up to the hilt. Seeing this miracle, he did as he was asked and gave up all of his possessions to live on the hill. Another version of the legend claims that Galgano intentionally put the blade into the stone in order to have a cross to pray to. For the next 11 months, Galgano was protected by the animals of the area. On one occasion, an assassin tried to take his life, only for wild wolves to protect him. The arms of the assassin are still preserved in a monastery built on the hill. Galgano passed away on December 3, 1181, and was made a saint four years later. An abbey was built around the sword that still remains in the stone today. For a while, it was believed to be a fake or even a modern forgery. But scientists confirmed that the sword in the stone was an authentic 12th century sword. How it truly came to rest in the stone is a mystery, though. Scientists also used ground-penetrating radar to look at what lay beneath the sword. They discovered a hollow chamber which may solve another strange and creepy unsolved mystery. Galgano's funeral was a major event, but his body was lost soon after. The chamber may be the burial chamber of the mysterious knight. Number 4. Aline Barrick was a woman who kept up with routines. So when her neighbor hadn't seen her for two days, he contacted the police to check in on her. What happened to Aline remains a mystery to this day. Aline was 61 years old at the time of her disappearance in 1996. She had been a widow for 14 years and lived alone in a gated community near Nolan River Lake. Most of the cabins around her home were vacation rentals. She only had a few full-time neighbors, but they knew one another well enough to know when Aileen's routine was broken. The last day she was seen was April 12, 1996. Earlier in the day, she had visited the chiropractor, then stopped at the house of a handyman that she had hired to do some work around the home. She also called her brother, who lived in Frankfort, Kentucky. Aileen was supposed to be visiting them that weekend, but called to say that she wouldn't be coming. She never explained why. That evening, she began her nightly routine. She walked her dog Fifi and stopped to chat with some teenagers who were renting a cabin. There was nothing unusual about the interaction and Aline returned to her home like normal. Two days passed and Aline's neighbors hadn't seen or heard from her. Her car was still parked outside, but Aline hadn't been spotted walking Fifi, which was very unusual. The Edmondson County Sheriff's Office was called and they performed a welfare check. Fifi was found in her dog crate, but there was no sign of Aline herself. Looking through the house, it was clear Aline had begun her nighttime routine. 
there was a burned out cigarette in the bathroom shelf, and her lower dentures were in the glass that she used to clean them. In the kitchen, her trash bag sat on the counter, still waiting to be taken out. It seemed like Aline had been disturbed mid-routine. There was no sign of forced entry, but there had been a struggle. Missing from the house were Aline's purse and the bedsheet from her bedroom. Other bedclothes were piled on top of the mattress. Aline's car keys were found in the home and her house keys were found in the car. But the key that Aline kept beneath a fake rock outside of her house was missing. It was clear foul play had taken place, but why remained a mystery. $400 was found in Aline's freezer, and the police believed that robbery wasn't a motive. Both the police and Aline's family believed someone she knew was behind the crime. She was dating a younger man at the time of her disappearance, though her family didn't know the individual's name. However, suspicion fell on the handyman, who moved out of the area shortly after Aline vanished. He was found guilty of unrelated crimes in Illinois. Aline's disappearance remains a mystery to this day. The police hope that as time has passed, someone might come forward with information that might crack this cold case. Anyone with information can contact the Kentucky State Police Department at 270-782-2010. Number 3. The ancient past is full of creepy mysteries that may never be explained. Those mysterious discoveries become even creepier when they're the first or even only discoveries of their kind. Archaeologists in Sweden made a shocking discovery in 2012. While investigators have been able to piece together parts of the disturbing mystery, the full truth may never be revealed. The dig took place in an area that had been a shallow lake thousands of years ago. A railway company wanted to build a new line through the area, which lies on the eastern shore of Lake Vatern in Sweden. That plan was stopped when the archaeological digs made their strange discovery. The skulls and other body fragments of 11 individuals were found, buried on a stone platform that would have been submerged in the middle of the lake. They date back 8,000 years and are some of the only remains of people living in this era that have been found in this part of the world. But the way that the remains were laid out has changed our understanding of this era. Where other burial sites have been uncovered, archaeologists have found that the remains have remained intact. Ancient people showed a great respect for the body's integrity and didn't remove or move parts of the body. That was not the case for those buried in the tomb of the sunken skulls. The skulls had been removed from the rest of the body and almost all were missing their lower jawbone. One of the male skulls was found with a foot and a half long stake in it. Another also had a spike inside. It's believed that the skulls would have been mounted on stakes. This wouldn't be too uncommon of a sight in more recent times, when enemies from a defeated army would be put on display in this disturbing manner. But this was the first time it was seen so early in prehistory. Another skull, this time that of a woman, was found with the bone of another woman inside. All the remains were found with the bones of animals, in particular wild boar and bears. Strangest of all was the healed wounds. Almost all of the skulls had wounds that had healed over time. The male skulls had wounds on top of their heads, while the women had wounds to the back and right side of their heads. The people had lived long enough for these wounds to heal and this wasn't the cause of their passing. One theory is that these individuals weren't defeated warriors, but had been important people in their communities. They had been buried traditionally before their remains were removed and placed in this sacred site. But it's a ritual that's never been seen before, and the true reason behind this scary discovery may remain a mystery forever. Number 2 In December of 1988, Lisa Bishop boarded a freighter headed towards Haiti. She and the other eight people aboard the ship have never been seen again. Lisa was a journalism student at Georgia State University and had been in her final year when she vanished. She wanted to write articles about the differences between the US economy and that of Haiti. So when a regular at the club where she worked offered her a spot on a ship heading to the nation, she jumped on the opportunity. The regular was a man named Florian Meyer Borsch. Meyer Borsch was described as a freeloader and a drifter, and he also worked as a marine mechanic and a sea captain. He had met Lisa a year earlier in the Metroplex nightclub in Atlanta. It was a nightclub owned by Lisa's boyfriend of three years and managed by Lisa. 
Lisa's boyfriend, and her parents didn't want her to go on the trip, but she insisted. On the afternoon of December 17th, the freighter set sail from Miami. The ship was an 82-foot freighter named the Frieden. Just before she left, Lisa called her mother and said she would phone again when they arrived in Haiti. That call never came, and the Frieden never arrived in Haiti. As the days passed, Lisa's family got more worried, but when she didn't call on Christmas Day, they knew something was wrong. They contacted the family members of the other people who had been on the Frieden. As well as Lisa and Meyer Borsch, there were seven Haitian crew members. None of them had contacted their families either. Lisa's parents contacted the Coast Guard. Searches of the waters between Miami and Haiti turned up nothing. There had been no distress calls and no reported storms in the area, but it didn't seem impossible that a sudden storm had sunk the ship. The mysterious disappearance made news headlines and caught the attention of a man named Bob Nyberg. In April of 1989, he contacted Lisa's father to tell him he had seen the Frieden. The sighting happened two weeks after the ship had supposedly disappeared. Bob was an underwater salvager who had been working in a port on Grand Cayman when he and his co-worker heard a ship coming into dock. They came back above water and saw the name Frieden printed on the back of the ship. Bob remarked on the unusual spelling of the word and went back to work. He was sure it was the same ship that had disappeared. Bob and Lisa's father went to Grand Cayman and learned that a man matching Meyer Borsch's description had been spotted around the same time that the Frieden was docked there. He was seen talking to a short man with black hair. One of Meyer Borsch's friends in Miami believed the man was named Felipe and mentioned that he might have been involved in smuggling. He was also the man that chartered the Frieden to sail to Haiti. In the years since the disappearance of the Frieden, a few others have claimed to have spotted the ship, but nobody who was known to be aboard it when it left Miami has ever been found. Lisa's family and the families of the Haitian sailors who were on board have continued to search for answers to this strange and creepy mystery. Number 1 On August 28, 2008, someone took the life of a young security specialist and army veteran named Kanika Powell. The crime came after a series of strange visitors which had left her friends and family scared and confused. Kanika was a security specialist working at the Johns Hopkins Laboratory in Maryland. It was her first office job after leaving the military and something she was excited about. She had top-level security clearance and couldn't share her work with her family. It seemed to them that she enjoyed the job and had no problems. But on August 23, 2008, Something strange happened. She was at her home in her apartment in Laurel, Maryland when someone knocked on the door. He claimed he was from the FBI and asked for Kanika by name. He said he needed to speak with her about a fraud case. Kanika didn't answer the door as he wouldn't give his name. He held up a badge to her peephole but she believed it was fake. He eventually left. Kanika saw him holding a folder or an envelope and she noted he was wearing a North Face jacket which was very strange for that time of year. She called her local FBI office, which confirmed that he didn't work for them. She then told family and friends about the strange event, fearing that this might be someone trying to get into the homes of other women who lived alone. This was just the first of three strange occurrences. Four days later, another stranger came to the door. Again, Kanika didn't answer the door but spoke to him through it. He said he had a package for her that needed to be signed for. As she hadn't ordered anything, she didn't let him in. One of Kanika's friends who was in the area spotted the man. He was described as being a black man about six foot tall and with a beard. He was wearing a FedEx shirt with the sleeves cut off, shorts, and tan Timberland boots. Kanika called her mother and friends again and they urged her to stay with one of them for the night. The mystery men weren't the only concern. Kanika had also been coming home from work to find a cigarette and cigar butts on her doorstep as if someone had been waiting for her. Kanika refused the offer and stayed home. Early the next day, August 28th, she received another knock at the door from another person claiming to be a delivery man. Once again, she didn't answer the door. She called her mother at about 7.30 a.m., clearly rattled by the events. She was going out of town that weekend with her girlfriend and needed to get her car serviced. Kanika told her mother she was taking the day off of work to do that so that she wasn't out and about late at night. 
It was as she came home at about noon that day that the attack happened. Neighbors heard screaming and Kanika crying no before the sound of a weapon firing four or five times. They didn't see the attacker but found Kanika in the hallway. She was taken to the hospital and passed away the following day. At first, there was speculation that Kanika's job might have been the motive behind the attack, given she worked in national security. Kanika's friends thought the answer was much more personal. She had only recently begun dating her girlfriend and they were set to go out of town for a pride event. The unnamed girlfriend had a jealous ex-boyfriend who they believed could have wanted to stop the trip. No suspects have ever been identified in the case, but someone in the area likely knows what happened to Kanika. Her family has urged anyone with information to come forward. Prince George's County Police Department can be contacted on 301-352-1200. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.